Azerbaijan says it wants to reintegrate the ethnic Armenians of the Nagorno-Karabakh region peacefully after Baku forced the surrender of the separatist forces defending the breakaway territory. Representatives from the Karabakh's Armenian forces are expected to meet Azerbaijan officials tomorrow. Armenia's government says that ethnic Armenians of the Nagorno-Karabakh could theoretically live under Azerbaijani rule, but highlighted that dialogue is crucial. Azerbaijan began an offensive to take control of the enclave just a day ago. Karabakh officials say more than 30 people have been killed. Armenia and Azerbaijan were both members of the Soviet Union, and in the three decades since its collapse, they have already fought two wars. And here's a look at how we got here. Nagorno-Karabakh is at the center of the conflict. It's a mountainous region within Azerbaijan and is internationally recognized as part of it. But it's known as Artsakh by Armenians, and its 120,000 inhabitants are predominantly ethnic Armenians. They have their own government, which is close to Armenia, but not officially recognized by it or any other country. Armenians, who are Christians, claim a presence in the area dating back several centuries before Christ. Azerbaijan, whose inhabitants are mostly Turkic Muslims, also claim deep historical ties. Bloody conflict between the two peoples goes back more than a century. The region saw two wars after the Soviet Union crumbled. One that took place between 1988 and 1994, and a second that lasted 44 days in 2020. Over the course of the two wars, tens of thousands died. In the first war, over a million people were displaced. Most of those were Azeris, driven from their homes when Armenia ended up with control over Nagorno-Karabakh. In the second, Azerbaijan managed to take back a third of Nagorno-Karabakh. Russia brokered a ceasefire between the two, providing peacekeepers to guard the Lachin Corridor, a crucial road that connects the territory to Armenia. Analysts say successive rounds of talks have brought the two sides closer to a permanent peace treaty, but a final settlement remains elusive. Tensions started ratcheting up again when a group of Azerbaijani civilians, identifying themselves as environmental activists, began blocking the Lachin Corridor. An Azerbaijan checkpoint was set up, blocking the flow of goods to Armenia. It caused what the U.S. called a rapidly deteriorating humanitarian situation. The International Committee of the Red Cross was able to make eight deliveries this week. And for more, we are joined by Professor Kerry Kavanagh from the Patterson School for, of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky. He's also a former U.S. ambassador and mediator for the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for joining us. Now, firstly, there's been this conflict that we see, a conflict for control of the Nagorno-Karabakh region. It's been happening for years. What has been the catalyst uh, to cause tensions to flare up this time? I think that Azerbaijan decided when it wasn't able to conquer all of the territory back, yeah, three years ago, um, that the, here was a moment where there was an opportunity to try to finish it. Uh, sadly, we had hoped that there would be a peaceful settlement, and there been, as the piece you just played laid out, a, a serious pattern of discussions still taking place uh, over the last few months. There have been talks uh, with the Russians. There were multiple talks with Secretary of State Blinken and the Armenian and Azerbaijani foreign ministers in Washington. And progress was being made there. But I think with the world distracted over Ukraine, leadership uh, busy this week in, in New York, um, the government in Baku decided to uh, take a military action. We had seen troop movements and uh, maneuvering for the past week or so, but ostensibly uh, some Azerbaijani soldiers were killed when they encountered a landmine, and that led to the fighting. And the fighting, as we see, in just 24 hours has led to a ceasefire and some on-the-ground talks that should take place tomorrow. Professor, as a mediator for this conflict, what would you say are two major obstacles to a potential peace deal? 
I, I think that the dilemma is this perception that comes about in in some leaders' eyes that you can solve these problems militarily. This problem has been around for decades. And if you do it by use of force, and, and this is something that's been stressed all week in New York at the General Assembly meeting, um, use of force isn't how you solve uh, political problems. You need to solve them uh, diplomatically at the bargaining table. Um, this is the problem with Ukraine. It's We can look all around the world and see it again and again. Um, this action may lead to a situation where the Karabakhi will disarm, but it may also lead to a situation where they all end up fleeing into Armenia, a sort of soft ethnic cleansing, and it doesn't mean the problem won't reappear again. Um, if it had been settled in a peaceful way, I have greater hope for it not reappearing. So I guess the challenge here, how do you take care of the people who, who now will feel very threatened in their day-to-day -day life? And how do you make sure the conflict doesn't erupt again? Well, Russia has been heavily involved in this. Russia has brokered the ceasefire, as mentioned earlier. Uh, why are they involved? What do they stand to gain here? So Russia has a formal defense arrangement with Armenia, maintains a military base in Armenia, and, and for decades actually worked with uh, other European powers in the United States to find a settlement of this. We set up a special negotiating mechanism that included Russia, the United States, and France that for a good 20 years worked with the leadership of all parties to find a solution with the understanding that if it was backed by three UN Security Council members with veto power, this this had a good chance of lasting. You know, we were going to find a solution that the parties like Russia, France, United States were comfortable with, and the outsiders would provide whatever was needed to make sure it would work. Uh, Russia, in the last ceasefire arrangement, uh, provided on the ground peacekeepers. There's about 2,000 of them, and, and and that helped make a fragile peace possible but it didn't end up resolving the problem. And we saw with the blockade, as was noted in the video clip you played, uh, Russia was not able to get beyond that. Um, this region has been starved of food and medicine for the past nine months. Professor, along with Russia, Turkey is also involved. It backed Azerbaijan's actions and had supplied it with military equipment. Why? Why is it involved? What does it want to achieve from this? Um, um, Turkey and Azerbaijan have long been been partners. Uh, their languages, their cultures are, are, are related. Um, and, and I think so that was no surprise. The surprise was three years ago when Turkey actually seemed to prompt Azerbaijan to be more aggressive. And, and 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 giving them sufficient arms. And Azerbaijan had been buying arms from Turkey and Israel and others for quite a while. They had built up a military potential to be able to prevail on, in fighting on the ground, which they did. Um, I think Turkey sees this as also a chance to eliminate the problem, at least the military aspect of it, but it really isn't still bringing about the lasting peace. Um, President Erdogan in his presentation in New York at the UN this week uh, highlighted Turkey's support for Azerbaijan's military action. So it's clear they are a partner there. Um, they certainly um, see Russia being weaker in the region of the Caucasus in Central Asia and probably see an opportunity here to expand Turkish influence and engagement. Well, with the ongoing conflict at the moment, is Azerbaijan inheriting a volatile situation, one where there's tension between Christians and Muslims? And they, they are because... Because, again, it wasn't worked out at the table. And I think a lot of attention is going to be paid to how the people are treated 
And it's it's not clear the way that it's always been fighting, not as much talking is needed. Uh, what will happen to people who were just defending Karabakh? If they lay down their arms, um, what is their fate? Um, Azerbaijan deemed this was an anti-terrorist operation. Are they prisoners of war? They can be treated as terrorists. Are they going to be allowed to leave and go to, say, Armenia? Um, and then how are you going to monitor that treatment? Um, Azerbaijan has been uh, singled out repeatedly for significant human rights violations. Um, I think that tension will be there, and, and you were correct. There will be a perception um, you're picking on them, you're mistreating them, you're not doing this properly because they're Christian. Um, it's at the same time true in this region, the Caucasus writ large, Christians, Muslims, Jews, Zoroastrians, Buddhists have lived together peacefully for millennia. So there's no reason for that kind of clash here. This clash hasn't been based on primarily on religious grounds. It's been based more on nationality grounds. And again, I think can be dealt with uh, in a more peaceful way, more effectively. And I think what we need to see next is a, a, a more peaceful resolution of how we'll handle the, the situation that has come about just in the last 24 hours. Thank you, Professor, for your analysis. We'll have to see how those talks go later today. We were just speaking to Professor Kerry Cavanaugh from the Patterson School of Diplomacy and International Commerce at the University of Kentucky.